All right, I got it working. Yay! Everybody go yay! yay. All right, we got a yay. That's almost that almost worked. All right, uh, you should have watched the video before the weekend about World War One in general. Okay, I want to take a little time with you guys in the room just on the weapons of World War I. Just, we did talk about it a little bit in the video, but I want to spend time specifically on the weapons. And what I'm asking you to do is look to see what weapons, what they all have in common. Okay, how are they different than weapons from before this time period? What makes them significantly different? Everybody got that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they, the newer guns that we have now have more technology and more, um, more, efficient. more efficient. Yes, they're going to be more efficient during World War One than the, before then. Yes. The weapons are actually full auto now. They're going to be full automatic, and that's a big change. Yes, that's going to be a big change. Well, why were new weapons created during World War I? Well, you have to understand the way the war started. And the war started uh, with the Germans fighting the Schlieffen Plan. Remember the Schlieffen Plan from the video? Did the Germans attack France right at the border between Germany and France? Not very much. What did they do? They went from, they went to Belgium. That's right. They went around mm -hmm. because they knew the French weren't guarding the border between Belgium and France. So they marched through an, another country, a neutral country, Belgium and Luxembourg. They marched through those two countries and then the French were caught off guard. Mm -hmm. But the French, um, the Germans made a mistake in that battle plan. Does anybody remember the mistake that the Germans made? Go ahead, say it loud and proud, my friend. The English were also there. That's true, but that's not the mistake they made. The Germans put the same number of troops across the entire line attacking into France. But the, 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 the outside of that wheel... In other words, the side that would be closest to the coast had far, the farthest distance to go, okay? And the way you should have done that is put more troops on the outside with less troops on the inside of that wheel, for lack of a better way of saying it. They didn't do that. And so eventually, the French were able to swing over, and just before the Germans were able to get to Paris. What's Paris? Paris. Paris. Very good. We're not talking about Mrs. Hilton. Okay. The, the French were able to dig in their lines, their trenches. So that's one of the first weapons I actually want to talk about is the trench. And the trenches were dug, were they dug in straight lines? This is something we had before. No, they were not dug in straight lines. They were jagged. And the jagged line of the trenches gave points that were closer to the enemy for firing and close points that were farther away for greater protection. It also faced, forced the enemy to kind of fight into that V, for lack of a better way of saying it. So you would have weapons firing at you at, from all sides, pretty much, if you got close to the trench. It, it was very effective. And one of the weapons of World War I that made it very effective, sir, was the... Uh, I forget the Lewis gun? Just generally, what gun as a general name, not the exact name, no. the general name of the guns? Yes, sir. Machine gun? The machine gun. Fighting before World War I in European wars were based on the charge. You guys have all heard it. In fact, you guys, I want you to say the word charge after I do this. You guys ready? One, two, three. 
Charge! That's right. And in, in the 19th century, that's what warfare was based on. And they would have muskets or rifles. And on the end of their musket or rifle, you'd have a bayonet, right? And the goal was to be more disciplined than the other side and make the other side break their ranks. And then you'd have your men. Charge! We'll take it. Okay, they would charge at the other side with their bayonets and basically win the field. Okay? That was how war was won in the 19th century. In the 18th century, especially in Europe, it was very effective in an open field with muskets. Notice I said muskets. Still doable with rifles. Notice I said rifles. Not very effective against machine guns. They get, uh, and it's not just one person with a machine gun doing that. It's a whole trench full of guys going, uh, and in between, another weapon of World War I I want to talk about. Yes? Gas was coming, and we'll get there. But in between the trenches for the two sides, you had no man's wet man, and one of the defensive weapons was uh, back here. Artillery. Okay, that, we're going to talk about that later, too. You're not entirely wrong. Planes. Uh, no. Yeah, in between, like in between the trenches, literally laying between the trenches. Yes. Barbed wire. Barbed wire. Any of you try to go through barbed wire on a farm? No, it hurts, doesn't it? Farm. I actually made it through it without getting anything caught, except for my shirt. But it still hurts, right? Yes. And can I tell you that farming barbed wire is not like war-grade barbed wire? Because no. war-grade barbed wire... It's like that curling barbed wire with all those... Razors. Things. It's like razors. Intentionally like razors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And she brought up a good point that I wasn't going to bring up. But if you ever look at the top of the fence of a prison, mm -hmm. the barbed wire isn't going across like you would for a cow farm. It's going in circles. That's so that prisoners cannot get through. And if they accidentally put their hand up, ah! Right. Because they can't get through it. It's like that. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right, so let's, by the time you get to 1916 in the war, new weapons have to be produced to get through the trenches. The Germans had some uh, weapons I want to bring out. One of them was the Kleine Flammenwerfer. Notice I do not speak German. And it's that big, large word you're seeing on the screen. You know the English version of that word. Flamethrower. Flame flame it's a backpack full of flammable liquid and hose connecting to the flame. And it was used to fire into a trench. So you had to get close enough because you had to get within 20 yards. But if you could get within 20 yards of the trench, you could throw the flame into the trench. What's that going to make the men do in the trench? They're going to scurry away, and then what can you do? Da actually gain control of that trench. Right. Yes. Now, there were problems with flamethrowers of World War I. They weren't as efficient as the flamethrowers you're going to see, like, in the Vietnam War later on. They were cumbersome. They could only fire 20 yards. You could use it up easily with just one shot. But as you can see, it was, it was good for what we mentioned, getting men out of a trench.
The next one we already mentioned, somebody mentioned it, poison gases. Now there were all kinds of them. There was tear gas, there was chlorine gas. Um, the French first used tear gas in 1915. The Germans used chlorine in 1915. Uh, you had something called phosgene, where people would die from convulsions from coughing and choking. And the thing with phosgene that made it really bad was it was time released. So you breathe in large quantities of it, and it took 48 hours before it would actually kill you. It caused logistical nightmares. Uh, a lot of the problems is it, it also clogged the ability of the medics to help people in battle. So this was literally an attack on, on the medics, on the, on the doctors. Because they have too much to do, they can't help the men in the field get well. Now there was a problem with poison gases. What do you notice in that picture about the gases? Yes, yes sir. The wind could also blow it back in. That's right, so the wind is blowing away from you right now. This is 1914 through 1918. That's when World War I was fought. Meteorology wasn't at the place where it is now. Predicting the weather was any man's guess, literally. You watch it today and it's anybody's guess, but it was really literally any man's guess back then. And the wind could change directions. So if you set um, gas out onto the fields and then the wind changed direction, you didn't kill the other side. You gassed yourself. You gassed yourself. It happened all the time. And as you can see here, the men couldn't breathe. You needed a gas mask. You guys can appreciate how irritating a mask is more than any class I've ever had. You're wearing one, not a gas mask. To whoever flagellated, you probably wish it was a gas mask. But that being said, you guys appreciate how cumbersome and irritating they are. Little things you don't think of, like, how do you drink water? How do you eat? And then with them, if they, if the gas, they wouldn't be able to do any of that, because they were... Right. They were at the mercy of the wind. Yes, ma'am. That's true. Initially, when gas was first used, nobody expected it. So the so at the very first battle it was used, I hate to say it, it was very effective for what it was used for. Because nobody on the other side had anything to combat it. Initially, Somebody used a thick cotton headband, much like the mask you guys are wearing, except a little thicker. But eventually the, the French and the British develop the first true gas mask, as we know about it, which is a respiratory device. And this is a gas mask. It kind of makes, it makes them look a bit freaky. It does. And it depersonalizes the war. Okay? You can see it depersonalizes people. It makes... They would also have to gas mask their dogs. Dogs were important in the war effort. They could smell out, for example, landmines and... The gas itself. And the gas itself. So they were... Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's actually some, it's actually a true story, but um, it was a pit bull, I believe. Uh, it, I believe it was Sergeant Stubby, but he, he was trained to smell out gas for the uh, soldiers. And they 
also made a movie about it. Yes, see the blisters on the body? And those blisters weren't just on the outside of the skin, they also were blistered inside the lungs. Yes. It was very painful. The eyes. It wasn't just the breathing. It was the all the mucous membranes. All right. Hand grenade. Uh, believe it or not, the first ones were, were, were homemade. Um, they went by a lot of different names. Um, they, they had the weighted percussion, the jam pot, the hairbrush. Uh, the hairbrush one killed a fifth of the men who used it. Mills bomb. Um, they had to be taught how to throw it. Uh, believe it or not, the hand grenade was one of the first fatalities in airplane attacks. You know, initially, right at the beginning of World War I, the planes did not attack each other. They were only to, like, scout what the other side was doing, and they go back, and the, 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 the guys from the other side would wave at each other. Hi, fellow pilot from the enemy. Hi. They would wave at each other. I kid you not, they would wave at each other. Now, that was in 1914. That didn't last very long. I would just shoot them down. Somebody got the bright idea to take a hand grenade with them and toss it into the plane of the other side. But you also have to think, it doesn't necessarily mean the men have anything against each other. It's that they're being sent to war. But right. It doesn't mean that they have to hate each other. It's just they're trying to... But then somebody threw a, we, uh, somebody threw a hand grenade into the plane yeah. as they were tipping their wings. You guys have seen planes tip wings. They get close and they tip their wings and go. Oh, somebody threw a hand hand grenade and poof. So then people started taking guns, handguns with them into the planes, the evolution of plane fighting, or dog fighting as it was called, because, you know, the planes were like dogs, I guess. I don't know. But then there was a problem. If you had a pistol and you shot forward. You'd fly right into your bullet, wouldn't you? No. Well, your bullet would fly through the yeah, it would break the propeller, and then you go. So then they developed basically a brake. You would pull the trigger, and the propeller would stop. So you could shoot your, and then they put machine guns on them. And they be, then they became, you know, full out dog fights, as we would call them, dog fights. Yes. Remember to talk loud. So they have machine guns and other guns, like maybe like a turret on the back of the plane. Yes. Then they began having somebody else with them. They weren't solo flights anymore. And it evolved. Literally, airplane battle evolved during and then World War. Like dropping bombs, dropping gas maybe from the airplane cargo. All right. You can see the hairbrush grenade. Yep, one in five died. Hand grenade. You get the point. It's it's a bit obvious when you look at it. Yeah, it is. Like the tank. Now the tank was a major development. You got to remember when World War One began. The Model T was only in existence for a couple of years at that point, like seven years. So I mean. <coughs> The automobile had been around for 30 or 40 years, but for most of that time period, it was a toy of rich people. It wasn't something that most people had. Do you know on the Eastern Front, at the beginning of the war, the Russian and Austro-Hungarian armies had a battle, and the, the main charge was done with horses. Still in 1914. Not very effective because <laughs> you also have machine guns. Whoops. Horses don't do well against machine guns. I don't care how fast they are. Bullets, gotta be, bullets go for a few kilometers per second. Horses can only go like a kilometer 
here in a few minutes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the tank was basically invented as a as a trench buster. It was meant to go over no man's land, which had barbed wire. Barbed wire. And there were all kinds of tanks that were developed. The Mark One. Here's the Mark One. You can see that the early tanks don't look like what you would think of as a tank. You can see certain things like the. Uh, One's yeah. But it's not what you normally think of as a tank because most of the time what we think of as a tank is as a World War II tank. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is World War I. Uh, you had exploding artillery shells. They were filled with power, powder that on impact they would explode, basically spreading shrapnel all over the place. You could really say this is like a mega hand grenade, except it's not a grenade. No, not throw it. You'd have to shoot it. And then when it landed, it would blow up. And the metal casing would... And it... And when the... Yeah, and they... they it was very, very... Uh, deadly. Yeah. All right, submachine guns or machine guns. There were all kinds of them. You had the German MP-18. You had trench mortars, which were narrow vertical cylindrical tubes, which an explosive was placed in and shot out of. Okay, this was basically like a... Um, It, it was meant for tight spaces in the trenches, but it was something that had some boom to it. It wasn't so a bullet. It was like an angle, kind of. Yeah. And then you put the shell in and then fire it, and it would come up here, and then it would swoop down and land in on the other. Yes, yes ma'am. This isn't really related to this part, but with trenches, they would always have this little room for sleeping. But uh -huh. Yep, and sometimes you had uh, men on their own side trip it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We already talked a lot about the air war and the dog fights and how they, they evolved. Um, the Roland Garros was the first one to be plane to be a, a, equipped with a machine gun. And as World War I would advance, so wouldn't the planes. So the propellers at the very beginning of World War I, you still had wooden propellers at the beginning of World War I. By the end of World War I, you have metal propellers. At the beginning of World War I, they were single flight aircraft. I mean, look at the one on the top center there. The one at the top center, I mean, that's not gonna withstand anything. It, it basically is. It basically is. Now look at the ones at the bottom. They tend to be, as you go towards the bottom, more recent, towards the end of the war. Not exactly that way, but you get the gist. They kind of look a little bit like a helicopter. I mean, look look at the one on the bottom. Is that blue or purple, by the way? I'm colorblind. Blue. blue. Okay. You'll notice it has a bomb on it. You see it? Yeah, it has a bomb on it. You could drop a bomb from it. Yeah. And, and, and so you could, you know, air flight was relatively new. 
you had very few quote unquote trained pilots. So if you were a trained pilot going into World War I, in a way you had it made at first because you weren't gonna be in the trenches. But by the end of the war, war you didn't have it made because <laughs> you're getting shot at in the air. You don't live through that very easily. Okay. Here you can see them flying in formation. Why would they fly in formation? Just like they did. Um, Part of its protection. Yes. Yes, part of it was protection. Why in that formation? Why a V shape? Yes, ma'am. Is it because like birds, some, like different species of birds fly in a V shape? That's where we got the idea from. Why do they? Why do they? Why are birds flying in a V shape? Probably so they. Probably so they can tell which plane is on their side. No, you're close. Why do birds fly in a V-shape? Yes? So they stay together and don't get lost? Why? Um, so when they're shooting, they can't just shoot everything. It's more aerodynamic. In the V-shape, the plane in the front is consuming the most, most gasoline. And after you fly a few miles, one, you know, the plane on the back, would then go to the middle, and then this side would split, and that plane would go to the front. And it was a way to save gasoline as well. So you could fly farther. Yeah, yeah. And we got it, Canadian geese fly that way, if you've ever noticed. Yes? Um, and another thing with airplanes, um, they're a bigger target. True. So they're more easier to find than an actual person. Yep. All right, air war. Planes were not the only part weapon in the sky. Believe it or not, you had hot air balloons, especially at the beginning of World War I. They would be flown behind your front lines. But just think, if you could get up a thousand yards in the air or 3,000 feet with a hot air balloon you can see a long way right and you can convey that information to the men on the ground yeah <coughs> you also had something called the zeppelin we would call a zeppelin a blimp the German zeppelin The advantage of the Zeppelin is you didn't have to use a lot of fuel to keep it in the air. Because it's like a big balloon, it just yeah, floats. It floats. And so you could bomb off a Zeppelin. What's the disadvantage of a Zeppelin? Ooh. Yes, sir. It's, um, it's filled with helium, which makes it highly flammable. Yeah, it's very flammable. Like it'll burn up very quickly. Yes. Zeppelins and blimps are also kind of slow. They are slow. And if it gets shot, it will start losing the helium. That's right. And then it will just start to go down. That's right. Yes, ma'am. They're very big. And they're very easy to see. Yeah, so you can shoot that thing down no problem. Well, it it's high up in the air. Mm -hmm. I don't know bullets. So Zeppelin... At the beginning of the war, the Zeppelin was the thing that could fly the highest. An airplane couldn't get that high at the beginning of the war. So keep that in mind. The technology will change as the war goes along. At the beginning of the war, the highest flying thing was a Zeppelin. Yep. All right. Um, any questions from you guys? Comments? Thoughts? How many of you watched that video 
that was just a few minutes long of the guy that was being interviewed. He was already a hundred some years old when he was being interviewed. What did you think of that interview? What stood out to you? He, He described what life was like, and it was horrific. War is not, we tend to clean it up. War is not a clean thing. It's a very dirty, scary thing. Okay? Um, and, And that's why we should honor the men who did fight to defend us, because they went through a lot. Give me just a second. I'm going to turn off the video part of this.